the things that uh, I wanted to talk about this morning, uh, it's not necessarily the building, but what I consider the church, which is the people. And I would like to read out of Isaiah 41, verse 10, to get started here. It says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee, but not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Now, as I was uh, preparing for this this morning, I was thinking about the church, about the people, and thinking about uh, what was going on, you know, several thousand years ago with uh, our apostles and uh, prophets. And uh, I was thinking about Paul and John, both. And during their time as uh, here on earth, uh, Paul wrote eight epistles to eight different groups. Now he wrote more than that, some to individuals, but the ones I want to focus on this morning are the ones that he wrote to the churches. And uh, the uh, Epistles that I wanted to uh, just review a little bit were uh, uh, the book of Romans and then Corinthians and Galatians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, Hebrews. And then uh, when we go into the book of Revelation, uh, I would like to just uh, touch, because that's what it'll be, just touch on uh, the letters that were written to the seven churches uh, there in uh, um, Asia Minor, which is Turkey today. So uh, the, first, the first one uh, I'd like to talk to you about is the book. It's written to the Romans. And it's one of the longest epistles that Paul wrote. <clears throat> And he wrote this letter to the growing church in Rome as a way of expressing his enthusiasm for their success and his desire to visit them personally. The bulk of the letter, however, is a deep and emotional study on the basic doctrines of the Christian faith. Paul wrote about salvation, faith, grace, and sanctification, and many practical concerns for living as a follower of Jesus in a culture that has rejected him. That's the basic theme of Romans. Now, if we get down into Corinthians, we're moving down into the country of Greece. Paul took a great interest in the churches spread out through the region of Corinth, so much that he wrote at least four separate letters to this congregation. Now, in the scriptures, we have two. The other two are incorporated into those, so there are actually four letters that he wrote to the Corinthians. If you, and I don't know if any of you have ever been to Corinth. Uh, I have. It's a typical uh, shipping city. It's a harbor uh, and whatever goes along with that. And uh, it's not a pleasant place. So uh, he had his work cut out for him. It says, because the city of Corinth was corrupt with all kinds of immorality, much of Paul's instructions to this church center on remaining separate from the sinful practices of the surrounding culture and remaining united as Christians. So this, uh, how I would describe Corinth to uh, Athens, uh, Corinth was more like a cesspool. <laughs> And it was not a pleasant place. Where Athens was the culture, the education, the knowledge, uh, it was like a direct opposite. In Galatians, 
Paul had found a church in Galatia, and this is in modern Turkey, around 51 AD that continued his missionary journeys. During his absence, however, groups of false teachers had corrupted the Galatians by claiming that Christians must continue to observe the different laws from the Old Testament in order to remain clean before God. Therefore, much of Paul's epistle to the Galatians is an appeal for them to return to the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith and to avoid the legalistic practices of the false teachers. And then we go to Ephesians. As with the Galatians, the letter to the Ephesians emphasizes God's grace and the fact that human beings cannot obtain salvation through works or legalism. Paul also emphasized the importance of unity in the church and in its singular mission. mission, mission. <clears throat> A message that was especially important in this letter because the city of Ephesus was a major trade center and populated by people of many separate ethnics. And then we go to Philippians. While the major theme of the Ephesians is grace, the major theme for the letter for Philippians is joy. Paul encouraged the Philippian Christians to relish the joy of living as servants of God and disciples of Jesus Christ. A message that was all the more moving because Paul was confined in a Roman prison cell while writing this particular letter. And then we go to Colossians. This is another letter Paul wrote while suffering as a prisoner in Rome, and another which Paul sought to correct numerous false teachings that had infiltrated the church. Apparently, the Colossians had begun worshiping angels and other heavenly bodies, including the idea that Jesus Christ was not the full God, but merely a man. Throughout Colossians, Paul lifts up the critical role of Jesus in the universe, his divinity, and his rightful place as as head of the church. In Thessalonians, and these, these books that have more than one uh, book, uh, these narratives are included in both. Paul had visited the Greek city of Thessaloniki during the second missionary journey, but was only able to remain there for a few weeks because of his persecution. Therefore, he was concerned about the health and the fledgling congregation. After hearing a report from Timothy, Paul sent the letter we know as 1 Thessalonians to clarify some points on which the church members were confused, including the second coming of Jesus Christ and the nature of the eternal life. In the letter we know as 2 Thessalonians, Paul reminded the people of the need to continue living <coughs> and working as followers of God until Christ returned. And then in Hebrews, which is the last one, Paul wrote to the Hebrews as a warning to Jewish Christians not to abandon the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith and not to re-embrace re the practices of law and laws of the Old Testament. For this reason, one of the major focuses of this epistle is the superiority of Christ over all other beings. And then we will move on to the book of Revelation and the letters that were written to the seven churches in the seven cities. If you look, if if you have one of the Bibles that is has the red writing in it, if you look at that, you will see that these chapters with the letters to these seven churches is all in red. So that tells us that those are the words of Jesus Christ. Now we know that Paul was inspired to write. An angel told him what to write, and he wrote that. But these are the words that Christ 
spoke. And so the scope of the message of the book of Revelation, that particular part with the seven uh, churches, even though the messages are addressed to seven specific historical churches of John's day, they're intended for all churches across the earth and across time. This is evident from the fact that each message includes a phrase, and each one of them does, says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Jesus had used this he who has an ear expression before to emphasize important points and if you want to write this down, I'll give you some uh, alternate scriptures that say the same thing. Uh, Matthew 11, 16, Mark 4, 8, Mark 4, 19 through 20, and Luke 14 through 38. Some of the remarks given in the messages are clearly specific to the historical local churches, but in general, the admonishments, encouragements, warnings, and commendations in these messages should be understood if directed at all churches. The fact that there are seven churches is significant because the number seven carries the meaning of wholeness. This suggests that these seven churches are meant to be representative of all churches and all professing Christians throughout the earth and throughout history. The thought for this morning. If you remember back when you were in high school, English class, and you learned about sentence structure, and, and we learned about nouns and verbs and adjectives and all that stuff, and a noun is described as a person, place, or thing. A church may be described as a place, which is true, but it is much more. It is a living, breathing entity. Those that are part of the entity make up the foundation of the church, which makes it grow in strength and numbers. The scriptures of Paul and John admonish, encourage, warn, and receive commendations. The churches are much like a garden in that if they are attend unattended, the weeds will take over the garden. The church is no different. It must be attended to on a regular basis by all its members for it to stay strong and ensure that the word of Jesus Christ is within their hearts. My concluding statement would be to you, if Jesus Christ was going to write this church a letter, what would that letter say? Let's continue our service with hymn 260. I don't know where our piano player's at. Well, where'd he go? Out the door. Well, okay, we're going to sing it a cappella then. <laughs> Let's please rise and we'll, uh, John's not here, so we'll, uh, we'll just wing it. <sighs> Wait a minute, he might be coming right this second. We're ready, 260.
Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you this day taking time out of the world to be separate, to come here to gain strength, to gain understanding of the scriptures, and to be one with one another. Father, we ask a blessing upon the services to come, that thy spirit would be with each and every one that is in attendance, that their hearts may be open and their minds may be free to receive that which will be given to them. Father, again, we thank you for this blessing of having a place to meet and to gather. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I was going to kind of continue the thoughts, and you can you've probably been getting a little ahead here looking at this while we're waiting. But I wanted to kind of continue in the ideas of sacrifice, faith, and our, uh, what our vision should be going forward. And I've given you a little bit of a testimony to read this afternoon called The Creston Experience. I read it last night in about 20 minutes. It's just a wonderful account of what happened in Creston, Iowa. Some of you, maybe all of you have heard it before. But uh, as I came across it, I thought, you know, we might need to take a look at that again. Because I think it has uh, some application for us to, that, to today. And if you're not familiar with uh, the Creston experience, it was uh, a testimony that developed over the course from like 1955 to 1965 era. And there's so many lessons that we can draw from their experience. And, uh, you know, history tends to repeat itself, and we want to repeat the good things, but not the bad things. And they had a mixture of both in there. And, you know, it was said of Creston, Iowa, that their congregation was just so messed up that Christ himself couldn't fix the congregation. That's what was said of Creston, Iowa. And yet, they experienced wonderful things. They, uh, in fact, they couldn't even get people to prayer meeting, and so they didn't have prayer meeting for the longest time. And uh, for whatever reason, and you, you can actually see some of the reason as you read through it, the first thing, just like I spoke on last week, prayer was number one. That was the baseline. And I wasn't, you know, last week when I spoke, I wasn't even thinking about the Creston experience. So I think it's the Lord really directing uh, things for us to look at and ponder. And fasting also became part of it. And uh, the, the pastor at the time, which is given the, the inter or which is the one being interviewed here, you know, he talks about his perspectives. Uh, through the growth of the congregation, his expectations, his surprises. And as you know, if you heard anything about it, John the Beloved visits the congregation for a period of six months and is showing himself to different individuals at various times. And, there's, and then there's some counsel given as to what they were doing good and maybe what they could improve upon. So you guys can, we might refer back to that as we get into the class here. But I just wanted to give you a little synopsis and really encourage you to read that today. And think about how it may apply to us as we move forward. So as you see on the handout, front page, I've got a definitions for three different words that I'd like us to think about in terms of uh, the scriptures and the conversation we'll have today. Sacrifice perspective and priority and uh, TJ once you get going there if you can get us a second microphone going there's no batteries or anything yet but sacrifice and these are from Oxford and Webster dictionaries the act of giving up something that you want to keep perspective a particular attitude toward or way of regarding something a point of view and priority, a thing that is regarded as more important than another. I think unless you guys got a comment, I think we'll get into the, some of the scripture here. And let's see how these three different words uh, and their definitions apply for us today. So the first thing uh, 
is we got, I'll read the first one here, and I think we're going to get the microphone here for the second scripture for comment. But we got Mark chapter 14, verse 40, and then Spired 36 in the King James. And this is the account of, by looking at the reference, uh, I think you need to turn down number two a little bit. Because I was getting some feedback. Um, Mark chapter 14 here. Does anyone know what the circumstance of the story is? Jesus. Jesus is talking here. Bruce? You want to know what the background of the story was? Yeah, yep. Where are we at in the scripture here? Yep. Well, uh, that is um, in the Garden of Gethsemane. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Jesus um, told his three disciples to wait while he went off in prayer. And he was in great agony as he was facing the uh, persecution and the crucifixion. Exactly. And just to add to it, uh, you know, it says that he... You know, he sweat blood. And that kind of seems like an odd thing to put in Scripture, right? Uh, how could that even be possible? Well, today, I don't, I don't necessarily have my reference for you, but I've seen it uh, in different articles that there's scientific um, backing to that. And the reason that something like that would happen is that it's one under great emotional stress. And so if you think about it into the perspective of what's going on here, Jesus is getting prepared to do the crucifixion, right? To take upon the sins of everybody that had lived, was living, or was ever going to live. I can't think of a more stressful situation, can you? Every single sin. And so... That's what's going on. And then in verse 40, can someone read verse 40 for me? Either in your scriptures or right there on the page, either way. Who'd read that? Bruce? Mark 14. Yep, Mark 14, 40. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from the, me, but nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Okay. In this first scripture that we're looking at today, I don't know about you, but I see all three words coming to play here. Sacrifice, perspective, and priority. Now, can you guys find where that is, or where do you see those three different words in play? Just raise your hand and TJ will come to you with the mic. Any takers? Bruce? Okay, the sacrifice comes when he says, not my will, but thine will. The perspective, uh, I think, is where he, sa where he's, he realizes that he's subject to God himself, his Father. And then the priority is... Um, not my will, but thy will be done. That's, that's the way I see them. Yep, that's how I see it too. It, it circles to the point of understanding where does my will come in respect to the Lord's will. And, and Jesus is teaching us that. I mean, who would want to go through what he went through, right? He didn't even want to, but he knew that he needed to. And so because of that, his perspective of the desire to go through with it followed through, even despite all the pain and the suffering, not only physically, but spiritually, upon taking all the sins. So to recap a little bit from last week, we're going to just touch very br briefly the, last, uh, the next two scriptures, Psalm 51, 16, and 17, and Doctrine and Covenants 59, 2e. And as you see that there, what is the sacrifice that God is asking of us? We've already touched on it last week, so you guys know the answer. He does want our hearts. Yep. Exactly. The broken heart, the contrite spirit. 
And that's how we know that our heart is, is right or not. And uh, if you looked at the second page, if you just flip it over because it's double-sided, I went ahead and gave you the lectures of faith that we discussed uh, a little bit last week, and I just thought we'd retouch some of these things and add to it. Let's see. I think we read... If we could read 7a, someone read 7a. It's on the back sheet if you flip. Lecture 6, 7a. It's the first one there. Terry, you got it? Yep. All right. Lecture 6, 7a. Let us here observe that a religion that does not require the sacrifice of all things never has power sufficient to produce the faith necessary unto life and salvation. Okay, I think we looked at that a little bit last week. So, you know, religion requires sacrifice. True and undefiled religion. And... You know, frankly, I don't think Christ has ever asked us to take upon the sins of everybody, right? So the sacrifice that he's asking us is not near what he went through for us. Bruce? When Jesus um, asked uh, that the cup be taken from him, uh, that reminds me of when he was on the cross. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And that uh, they spoke Aramaic, and that isn't in the Aramaic at all. The Aramaic states, my God, my God, for this I came into the world and I have conquered. Yep, fulfilling the Father's will, right? Yes. Yep, exactly. And so in us today, we need to think about, well, we have religion, and what does that sacrifice mean to us? Or what should that be? And it's different for every single one of us. Because going back to the definition of sacrifice, it's the act of giving up something that you want to keep. And then from the perspective, you realize there's a need for that sacrifice, and you, then you have that desire from that perspective, and so then you do it. Also with understand priority. God before me. But it's not all just about giving. When you give, you actually receive. Has anyone ever had testimony of that? You know, if you... I know for me, coming to church here, in just a very direct example, if I just come here to come sit in the pew, I don't get a lot out of church. My spirit isn't in the right condition to worship. But when I come to, to give, whether it's to, you know, be at the back just to say good morning even, something very simple, I come in a better mindset, and therefore I'm able to receive what the Lord has to offer. So with sacrifice, it's actually more given and take together. And that makes sense with, if you look at, still lecture six here, and if you look at, uh, we're really seven B, C, and D. Can someone just read those three verses for us? Lecture six, seven B, C, excuse me, lecture six, paragraph seven B, C, D. Brian? <coughs> For from the first existence of man, the faith necessary unto the enjoyment of life and salvation never could be obtained without the sacrifice of all earthly things. It was through this sacrifice, and this only, that God has ordained that men should enjoy eternal life. 
And it is through the medium of the sacrifice of all earthly things that men do actually know that they are doing the things that are well-pleasing in the sight of God. When a man has offered in sacrifice all that he has for the true sake, not even withholding his life and believing before God that he has been called to make this sacrifice because he seeks to do his will, he does know most assuredly that God does and will accept his sacrifice and offering and that he has not nor will not seek his face in vain. Thank you, Brian. I love this set of paragraphs here. It gives the, the you know, because a lot of scriptures you read about sacrifice and, well, you need to do this, you need to do that. But this tells you a little bit about why is it, why is it benefit to you. It's so that you can enjoy eternal life. Number one, eternity, which is way more than this three score and ten, right? But also, uh, I loved 7D. It's through the medium, through, through the sacrifice that you make of what, how many earthly things? All of it, right? Now, does that mean you need to bring everything here to the church and give it to God? No, that's not what it's saying. What it's saying is, is your perspective and your priority needs to change. So that all things that you've been given stewardship to is just automatically for God's purposes. Because that's how you have a desire to use it for. And so by that, all that your earthly things are a sacrifice to Him. But if you do that, there's a promise here that men do actually know that what you're doing, God is accepting of and pleasing that you're doing those things. It's kind of a, you know, a catch-all. I'll make sure I do everything right just by giving it all to Him, and I know that He'll be happy with me. But also, um, well, you know, think about this. What was the first sacrifice in Scripture? Very first sacrifice. Abel? made the righteous sacrifice. And how did he know that he was going to please God? How do you know that? His father Adam actually made the first sacrifice. Well, true. But his father taught Abel, and Abel was faithful in doing the things that his father taught him. Exactly. And so... Which is what what God taught him, right? And so it's it's not just about the teaching; it's about being obedient to the teaching, right? And so we have these scriptures before us. We know what we're supposed to do. There's a variety of different commandments that we're supposed to follow. And so if we want to make sure that we're pleasing God, we just need to follow them. And it goes to such more than that. I think it's like Genesis 6, uh, 66, somewhere in there, where it says, it's not in the booklet, so you have to look it up, but where it says that you may enjoy the words of eternal life even in this world. You can enjoy the words of that now. You don't have to wait for eternity for that. So a New Testament scripture to kind of bring in the lectures of faith thought here. Matthew chapter 19, verse 16 through 24. You'll need to look it up in your scriptures. Brian? I don't want to get off uh, track just for one second, but in uh, Cain's eye, do you think he made a good sacrifice? I think it's very possible that he thought that. I believe he did, but it goes back to this... For the truth's sake. So he probably in his own mind, and the Lord even spoke to him afterwards. He said, you do well, but you're not doing what I'm telling you to do. The truth. And he was changing the whole purpose of what the sacrifice was of the, the lamb. Yeah, he probably gave some of his best produce or whatever it was because he was a gardener 
but it wasn't what the purpose of the sacrifice was, which was Jesus Christ coming in the millennium of time. And, and Cain didn't, didn't like that, that he had tried and made an effort, but the Lord didn't accept his, his sacrifice because it was not for the truth's sake. Yeah. And, you know, from what we've already talked about this morning, I see even more to that in that, number one, it was Cain's will versus the Lord's will. And so because you're not doing the Lord's will and otherwise following what he's given us, then it's not considered a sacrifice. And then by definition, it wasn't even a sacrifice because it's what he wanted to give. It's not what... It, you know, it wasn't something that he necessarily wanted to keep. It was like, well, this is my scraps here, you know, it, you know in perspective, I think. Oh, I was just going to say that in the days of Jesus, the, uh, the priest uh, would make a big show out of sacrificing. Uh, go up and drop a lot uh, in the... Uh, uh, in the bucket as opposed to the uh, uh, woman that uh, gave her last uh, cent and uh, uh, so uh, a lot of times sacrificing is just for uh, a show yep that's a good point you know well go ahead Brian so you, you covered it already this morning. It goes back to not my will, but thy will be done. And that's the problem. We have so many people think, well, I'll do this and it'll be acceptable. Well, is it God's will or is that your will? Is that your choice or are you following what he's telling us to do to sacrifice our sins and leave them at the altar and go away from those things? Or we just say, well, this is this is kind of something but it's not really what God said, but I feel like it's a sacrifice. Well, it doesn't work that way. It goes back to the money being tossed in to make a big show. You're getting honor from the world, but you're not getting honor from God. So just like Cain and Abel, your offering is not acceptable to God if you make a big show and get honor from the world. But if you do the things of God and are humble in those things, he will honor everything, every sacrifice that you make. But it has to be on his terms and not on ours. Not exactly. my will, but thy will. Even Jesus had to accept that. And he did. Which is more than most of us can do most of the time. <laughs> we try. Yep. Wait for the mic here. We're giving TJ his workout. I think the motive behind sacrifice is uh, love and uh, uh, when uh, people sacrifice out of love it isn't a hardship at all it's what they want to do and, and what they get joy out of doing exactly well you know so bring the love aspect into it because that's that's a very good point you know you think about just some life examples you know, uh, think about a mother or father that's been working all day and, uh, you know, comes home from the kids being at school or daycare or whatnot and makes a point to spend time with them to help them with their homework or to teach them maybe the scripture if they're a Christian family. That love is a sacrifice because through the, through the whole work day, do they really feel like dedicating that extra time to it? No, not really. They don't feel like it, but they're doing it. They're giving that up because they love. And there's a myriad of different examples we could bring up, I'm sure, of what sacrifice is. And we need to bring that into, well, both physical and spiritual sacrifices to what we'll give to the Lord, Brian. I just had one example that keeps going to my mind all morning. I keep thinking of young love. You know, when you and, and your wife before, you probably didn't mind driving all the way out to North Platte. It wasn't even something in the back of your mind. Amy and I, same thing. It didn't matter to drive three hours to see each other. It didn't even phase us because that love was so strong. We wanted to see each other. We wanted to be together. Now... My question is, do you have that love for Christ? 
to where it doesn't is it even so phase strong you. it doesn't even matter what you have to face what you come into contact with what kind of sacrifice it is it doesn't even phase you because your love's so strong for him yeah you know i think we could end class right there i mean because that's that's really what we need to consider and ask ourselves pray to the lord you know where where are we at where's our spirits at because we know where they should be at and if we really are honest with ourselves we know where we're going to be at and it's going to be varied levels and we know what the goal needs to be and we need the lord to help us to get to that goal because if you look at and this is where i wanted to take it in thought if you look at scriptural examples you have uh people like paul the apostle you have uh, and since from our Daniel class, I, I, I really dislike calling them Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego because that's not their true name, but I can't remember what the real names were. But Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, you know, they, uh, David versus David and Goliath, and I could name all the, you know, all these folks, you studied them. They all have a common theme. They face certain destruction, right? varied ways but still it's not a good situation for them but because of their love for christ that's really what it is their love for the lord it does not phase them and so you know we talk about like end time stuff right you know from from time to time and we you know maybe ask ourselves a question well if uh you know they were going to behead me or something for my faith would i follow through with it would our answer be like Shadrach Meshach and Abednego say you know what king you can do what you want but this is where my faith is and this is why it's there Are you going to be like that or not that's a, that's a debate for you to have with, with yourself and the Lord but it really goes back to where's your spirit in regards to sacrifice right what was that aren't we kind of there right now with lights coming out of our government and stuff, and the things that they want us to focus on, and the things that we're being told we need to set aside. We haven't seen nothing yet. But, uh, and I'll tell you, a little bit of, you want a little bit of current events. I just read this report of uh, in um, British Columbia and Canada, there's a father of a 14 year old girl that uh, is now going to be serving prison for five years because he will not submit to her being a guy simple as that and you know if you think that we're far from that we are not and so to your point where are you going to stand and it's going to be dependent upon what level is your sacrifice and what's your perspective and priority of that sacrifice? Bruce? It was an uh, interdenominational uh, meeting uh, in Europe in which uh, there were Russians, uh, Europeans, and Americans that were there. And this uh, Russian uh, Christian said to the uh, American, um, uh, he said, uh, if you had the... Uh, uh, danger uh, and the hardships that we Christians in Russia have to face, I don't know whether you'd still be a Christian or not. And the Americans said, uh, well, if you had all the uh, worldly uh, temptations and immorality that uh, come to us from every direction, I don't know whether you'd be able to withstand that or not. <laughs> Yeah, we all have fight our different, uh, have the different darts of Satan thrown at us. So it kind of goes back to, so this father, like you're talking about, Mark, there's all kinds of churches that would go right along mm -hmm. with the 14-year-old. And even some of the, I just had a conversation with some of the family this week, a, a Catholic person believing that um, abortion's okay and things like that. So what's true and what's not? Here's where we come back to the truth's sake. 
And I pointed right to the Bible and I said, that book says that's against that. And yet you say it's okay. So in your church, well, the Catholic church still says it's, they're still against it, but not, uh, they just kind of sweep it under the rug to keep their membership up. But um, it's still, if we don't follow the truth, we will be led into all the paths of, um, you know, the veil of darkness and the great mists and wandering paths that are right where that that 14 year old's at. And the, the world's pushing us off of the rod of iron. And the father, he's going to hold on to it no matter what happens. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, David, Daniel, all of them. He's like those men. Yes, he and is. Good for him. We ought to pray for him. We, we need to. Yeah. We need to. And I don't know if he's a Christian man or not. I suspect he probably is since he's so staunch. But, you know, it goes back to the sacrifice aspect of it. He went on record as to why he won't submit to it. He says, this is a 14-year-old girl. She has not grown up. She doesn't know where, where she's at yet. She has still time to develop. And I'm here to stand to defend that because I love her sacrifice even at the point of being thrown in prison quite literally all right so i think for sake of time you guys know this matthew 19 scripture it's the rich young ruler and through that conversation between jesus and the the young man you know says hey i've kept the commandments i've done everything i've in other words i've given you lip service and, and Lord knows this and says, well, you're doing good by doing all these good things. But I need your heart. And the only way I'm going to get your heart is if you sell what you have and give it to the poor, because you're loving that more than you're loving me. And so see there you have the lesson of priority. Sure, he loved the Lord. He loved to keep the commandments and everything, but he loved his money more. And there lied the problem to where he couldn't properly sacrifice. Let's see. Let's take a look at uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. And if someone can offer to read that for us. Terry? <clears throat> Let nothing be done through strife or venology, but in lowliness and of mind. Let each esteem other better than ourselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. I wanted to make sure we hit this scripture today, because I think it's something that we need to really consider, look at ourselves, and just ask, are we doing it? And if you're doing it, great. And if you're not, you got something to work on. But, you know, it, it gives us two warnings here. So whatever you're going to do through your sacrifice, doing things for the Lord, don't do it through strife or vainglory. So vainglory, kind of back to uh, like, like the, the sacrifice being done as a show, bringing the glory to yourself. That's a vainglory. You don't want any part of that. And then also with that can be competition and the, and the strife that can build. Is, oh, look what I did. Well, I'll do this over here. Look what I did. And it just kind of, you're drawing the attention away from the purpose of the sacrifice. And so it doesn't become a good one. And then, ah, yes. And lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. It's the broken heart and contrite spirit coming back to play. That's what that is. No matter how good you think you are, you know, TJ, he's really good on the violin, for example. But if he lets that get to his head, he lost the point of the sacrifice, right? He lost the point of this scripture. And that apply, and then that grows and expands to other aspects of his life. Now, TJ's not that way anyway, but just using for example. Look, uh, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. 
Look to the good of what others do. Prefer your brother, as said very commonly. In Hebrews 13, the scripture above that, By him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. Now for one, that's talking about our worship here. In the singing of our hymns, as we are silent together through prayer, as we listen to the spoken word, everything we do bring honor and praise to Him. And goes beyond our worship as a congregation too. But as we go about our day, are we worshiping the Lord? Everything that you do, are you worshiping Him? Should be. Bruce? On their... <laughs> On their way to uh, Jerusalem, where Jesus was uh, going to die on the cross, the apostles were arguing about who was the uh, greatest uh, among them. And um, uh, uh, Jesus addressed that um, when he washed their feet. Um, and, uh, but it really wasn't until they experienced the Holy Spirit that they completely got away from this, uh, uh, this uh, egotism. Yep. Very good point. Thank you. This, uh, oh, Janice. I guess probably this does not need to be said. But there's a beautiful spirit here today. I'm so happy that, happy that I'm here to feel that beautiful spirit. Well, and we're happy you are here because you are part of bringing and allowing that spirit to reside here. This verse 16 in Hebrews, but to do good and to communicate, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Communication's big, too. We need to be open with each other, back and forth. And part of that requires trust to a degree. And we need to show forth that grace one to another so that that trust builds. We need to show that mercy one to another, which goes back to what we read in Philippians. Uh, to esteem, uh, let, be lowliest in mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. To see the good in people. Because every single one of us have talents and gifts to offer. And as we encourage and uplift one another, those talents, those sacrifices we made, they'll be even made better. Yeah. <laughs> that word communicate uh, actually has two meanings that are tied to it in the original tongue, according to Strong's. And it's, it's not only the communication we think of like we're doing right here and now, that, cl that close sharing, but it also means it's an action of acting, giving, providing that sucker for others in the, in, in the physical sense as well as the spiritual sense. So it goes right back, ties right back to sacrificing our belongings, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, to, to those who have a greater need. Exactly. I mean, it, it goes to the point of uh, where we started, that we need to come to the Lord to give to Him, not just to come sit in the pew. You know, I, and take, for example, the live stream, which is a wonderful ministry, and it's much needed, and so glad that there's people that uh, tune into that. But it's, you know, what would happen if no one was here to do the live stream? It wouldn't happen, would it? And it's not healthy to rely upon others to sacrifice because you're not receiving as much from the Holy Spirit. There's so much growth, more growth to be had. And there's a myriad of other ways to, to sacrifice too. So to go to the perspective side, look at Deuteronomy on the second page, chapter 11, verse 13 through 22. Uh, let's see. So it starts off saying, if, you're, if you would listen, if you would hearken diligently unto his commandments, the Lord commands us, 
to love the Lord your God. That's number one, love the Lord your God. How many times we hear that? And to serve Him with all your heart, with all your soul. And he goes about how he blessed the land. But it goes, uh, see here, yes, verse 19. Well, 18, 19, 20. Can one, someone read 18, 19, 20 for me? Brian? Therefore shall you lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be as a frontlet between your eyes. And ye shall teach them to your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thine house, and upon thy gates. Okay. <laughs> In other words, to summarize this, every single thing that you do in life, do it for the Lord, and may the Lord be in focus. And their family is in that as well. And that's why it talks about, like, the doorposts of thine house, upon thy gates. Everything should be focusing to God and for His purposes. And there's blessing to that. That your days may be multiplied, and the days of your children, the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the days of heaven upon the earth. For if ye shall diligently, and it, see it's a chiasm here, 13 talked about keeping the commandments, 22 talks about the commandments. Diligently keep all these commandments which God command you, to do them, to love the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, not just some of them, but all of them, and cleave unto Him. It goes back to Brian's point about the love not even, not even phasing. You know how it says it says to write it on your doorpost. If you think back to the Passover, what were they required to do? The blood of the to, to put the blood on the doorpost. Now think about that. When you enter into your house, if that's on your house, that means you are whose? His. His. And that should be on our own homes, not that we should go out and kill a lamb and red blood, but when we enter our home, who should we think about before we go into our home? When we enter our church, who should we think about as soon as we, and our doorposts, when we walk in, that should be our first thought, that this is His, all of this. Yep. And we are His. You know, that's why I love when I go into a home and I see a scripture on there or something that kind of points to you know, reminding us of God, Christ, His church. You know that it's it's just a reminder to the family as they walk in. Oh, hey, there's that reminder for me. I need to keep in focus. Bruce? Uh, there's a story about uh, Martin Luther, and uh, he was uh, confronted by uh, Satan. And Satan was uh, bothering him about his sins. And uh, Martin Luther said, I am washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. My sins are forgiven by the blood of the uh, My sins are washed away through the blood of the Lamb. And Satan left him. Yep. Oh, very good. The last thing I want to share with you, and you can read it on your own, and, and I, in the email I encourage you to already look at, was Mosiah chapter 1. And it's King Benjamin's message to the people before uh, he passes on. And in that message, he says, you know, uh, like verse 51 here, I whom you've called your king, I've spent, you know, my, my days in your service, and yet, even though I've been in service to the people, I've been in service to God. That's been the whole primary for focus. And he says, if, if you're giving thanks to me, how much more should you be thanking our Heavenly Father, your Heavenly King? And, you know, he gives him some counsel and stuff, but he goes on to the point, and that's where you read the scripture where it talks about, okay, behold, aren't, aren't we all beggars? Let's just be honest with each other. And if we're beggars, we should take care of everybody that comes into our, uh, our midst. You know, and discern the situation and help, truly help them. And not judge them. Give them grace, give them mercy. 
And so, you know, with that, you know, if you haven't looked at the front of your bulletin, look at the image on there. It's the image of uh, Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. That's the level of sacrifice we need to get. That's what, if the Master did that, how much more should we need to follow Him and do the same. Give to others, serve each other. Serve each other even if it's to our inconvenience. Just like the mom or dad working all day to help out the kids at night, given the time, given the extra energy that they really don't feel like they have. And you know, back to that, isn't it amazing that the Lord blesses that parent with the energy to do it? It's a gift given through the sacrifice. So I hope you've learned a couple things or had a couple uh, aspects brought to your remembrance. And you definitely have some study materials. Please, please, please read through that Crescent experience. You know, I talked about, uh, you know, they were a small group. And they grew to about 125 strong. Their prayer meetings, they had 80 people come to their prayer meetings. And they had projections to go to about 400 members. The Lord told them that they could have that many. But because they went so far, and then they stopped sacrificing. And so the growth stopped. So a lot of food for thought in that spiritual experience. With that, I guess I'll go ahead and do announcements. Um, we got potluck today, so as the hour goes on, you're going to smell the food, and you're going to need to sacrifice your thought to hear the word of the Lord. So I hope you stay afterwards for potluck and fellowship with us. Uh, we've got prayer meeting at 6 o'clock on Thursday here. So I encourage you to come on out to that, or even join on Zoom if you can't uh, physically come. Let's see. Uh, building update, I don't think there really is any outside of, um, it's in the bank's hands at the moment. I think Brian's working on getting the building inspection done. You haven't heard anything, right? No. So, that's supposed to be done in the next couple weeks. So, uh, last week he said looking at closing around 30 days from then. That's all dependent upon what we see on the building inspection. Uh, any other announcements or, or prayer requests that need to be made? How's Molly doing? So continue to pray for Molly. Pretty sore. Jerry, how about you? Yeah, well, right now we're waiting on the test results. I'm just guessing probably Continue to pray for you. Keep us updated. Anyone else? Of course, if uh, someone comes to mind, you can shoot me an email or give me a call, text me, let me know, and I'll get the message out. Shelly, you still doing good? Stands again in May. All right. Part of my life. Yeah. <laughs> Well, if there's nothing else, we'll go ahead and uh, prepare for the service here.